I am so thrilled and privileged uh, to be able to introduce to you today a uh, Nicole Bo Ramming. Uh, I think you're going to find Nicole's uh, topic of grit and resiliency very relevant to us. When you think about some of the changes that are happening in our organization, some of the changes that are happening in our industry, with our customer expectations, um, with our own personal development, the concept of resiliency really uh, resonated with me. And what is so fascinating in talking with Nicole last night is understanding how we can leverage resiliency in everyday life. It's not just in the wake of tragedy. It's how we can all take advantage of resiliency. A couple of fun facts that we <laughs> that we learned about Nicole. Nicole is originally from the Bahamas. Nicole has moved 11 times in 26 years. Talk about resiliency and navigating change. Uh, at one point she spoke four languages and my favorite, she was a fire dancer as a child, which I thought was pretty was pretty uh, pretty interesting. So Please join me in welcoming Nicole Bo Ramming. Good morning, everyone. As she mentioned, my name is Nicole Bo Ramming, and I am excited to be here. Speaking about resiliency is one of my favorite topics. So before we get started, though, someone made the wonderful suggestion to me to turn my camera around and take a picture with you guys. Do you mind? OK. <laughs> Someone suggested it, I'm following it. I think it's a great idea. All right, so let's make sure I can get this right. Are you guys ready? Everybody got their best side showing? One, two, and three. Beautiful, thank you guys. All right. The power is not working. I have it on. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. While we're waiting for that to go to the next slide, we're gonna start, and then I'll just take you to the slide, okay? A lady's in a restaurant, and she's having lunch with a friend. And, well, friends. And all of a sudden, a cockroach flies in and lands on her. And she starts hitting at it and jiggling and just having a fit, right? And so she's doing this the whole time, and everybody's kind of looking around like, what is wrong with her? What is happening with her? Well, as she's dancing and trying to get rid of this thing, it lands on her friend sitting next to her. So what do you think she does? She continues to try to get this thing off her, and she's screaming, and she's making noise. And at this point, the whole restaurant thinks they're under attack and that there's a terrorist somewhere, right? Because these ladies are freaking out, right? And so the waiter comes over trying to take care of the situation, and he walks up, and he calmly looks. Well, as she's doing all of this, it flies on him, and it lands on him. And so the waiter stops, takes a look at the cockroach, grabs a nearby glass, cops it, walks out to the window, throws it out. Now, the person that created this story said they sat there and their antennas went up as they noticed the situation. Because the question was, did the cockroach create the chaos? And the question was no. It was the lady's inability to control their reaction to the cockroach that created the situation. And we go on to further look at it and go, do we do that sometimes in life, though? Do we have those kind of moments? Maybe a boss says something to us, a coworker says something to us, someone tells us Definitely one, right? Thank you. Oh, there was a waiter, sorry. <laughs> right? But someone's on the highway, and we're like, this is we're reacting. We're like this lady in the restaurant with the cockroach. And one of the things that I've observed with life is that you have to make a decision to respond and not react. It takes moving you from having an amygdala attack where you're like fight, flight, or freeze to that point where you can logically assess what's going on and handle that discussion with your boss, handle that situation with your coworker. What do you do with that customer that's totally over the edge? Or maybe that's your fourth customer over the edge for the day. What do you do? How do you handle it? And so that's what we're going to see. How do we apply these things as we go through? Fair enough? 
I'll ask you to close your eyes, please. Those watching virtually, close your eyes. Can't see you, but I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to think about your favorite dessert. I want you to think of the ooey gooeyest, warmest chocolate chip cookie, that brownie that sticks to the roof of your mouth, the ice cream that hits every spot in your mouth, that apple pie that has just the right of tart and sweetness. I want you to just think about it. How's it feeling? All right, now I want you to progress. I want you to take bites of this thing. And it was every, well, the first bite is almost, we won't say that word, but it's bursting in your mouth, right? You're like, oh, I've been waiting for this. This is my favorite thing. And as you go through, you keep eating it, and it just tastes better and better with every bite. And then you get down to that last bite. And I want you to think about how it feels to know that's the last bite you're about to take. It's gonna be gone after this bite. All of that taste and that flavor, it's gonna be gone. And you go to put it to your mouth and it falls to the floor. Open your eyes. You guys just experienced what it's like to move 11 times in 27 years. <laughs> just when you think you have the hang of it, just when it's just perfect, you've made friends finally, you have that job you want, you have all these things in place. It's time to move. It's time to do something different. It's time to be the little man on the totem pole at the new company. It's time to start my business over again. And we didn't have technology when I was doing it back in the day, so you didn't get to transfer anything with you. You start it over again. And I went through the grief, the denial. These are all parts of change. You grieve, you grieve, but you have to grieve. You have to let go of what was in order to embrace what's to come. If I stayed stuck at the last duty station, I would never fully embrace where I was. If I stayed at the last job mentally, I wouldn't be able to relate to my boss or my coworkers because I'm trying to do it the way we used to do it. Part of embracing change is understanding what's happening during that change. And the thing is, is change affects individuals first. Then it, 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 it affects the whole unit. So even with my family, I had to first deal with my own transition before I can walk my kids through it, before I could help my husband with it. Have you ever heard the term, put on your mask first? That's kind of what it's like when you're going through. You have to be aware and you have to make that decision to not just jump and try to help someone first. You have to put on your mask first during the challenges of change. Now, when we start talking about objectives, these are some of the three things I really want you guys to walk away with when we leave. And I'm going to check at the end to see if you got these things, OK? So we're going to understand how and why resiliency is an integral part of our lives. Why is it something that we need to practice every day, not just when we're in something catastrophic or when we think things have gone you know, horribly awry, it's about everyday life. The second thing is, how do you assess resiliency? The one thing I absolutely cannot stand is when someone tells me to be something, then will tell me how. That is the most frustrating thing on the face of this earth. Hey, be more resilient. But what does that look like? Because as far as I'm concerned, I am resilient. What are you talking about? So what we're going to do is we're going to look and see what that looks like and identify some areas that you can focus on and grow in. Yeah, you can grow in resiliency. We're going to debunk that myth that you're either born with it or not. All right? We're going, to we're going to identify our individual triggers. We all have them. Who thinks they don't have a trigger? I'm sorry. Maybe I'm wrong. Who does not have a trigger? Who just goes through life kind of Bleh. No trigger. Nothing bothers them. You cut them off on the highway, step on their toe, push them over the ledge, and they're great. We all have a trigger, OK? So we're going to figure out. How do we identify these triggers, and how do we use that to pro propel us to have productive responses and actions? How do we use that to move us forward? The iceberg of change. Normally, what people see is the top portion, the change in goals, policies. For me, it was whatever the new thing was for the base, or whatever they had going on at my new job. It was that change. You saw that surface portion of it. 
right? But what's really happening during change is beneath the iceberg. It's the stuff nobody wants to talk about. It's the stuff that we try to pretend is okay. Resiliency is not ignoring what's going on. That is not what resiliency is. Resiliency is being able to face it, adapt, and overcome it. That's what resiliency is. So here we have traditions. This is how we've always done it, right? Beliefs, they really don't like us. I was convinced one of our moves that my husband had done something to someone. Absolutely, they did not like us. That's why we got sent there. So you have these beliefs, but they're your personal beliefs. You don't really tell everybody what you think. But I'll tell you this, there's a trick to that. Those of you, if you want to know what someone else is thinking, watch their actions. Your thoughts will always show. The other one, feelings. I don't like this. I'm not sure about this. I'm uncertain. I don't know where to start. What is going on? I miss my friends. I miss the way it used to be. I want my old desk. Can I have my old outfit? I don't want to change the dress code. Can we just stay? But this is what happens, right? You guys are laughing. You guys don't experience this. Oh, okay, no problem. All right, values. Sometimes values tweak just a little bit. And by values, it could be something of your personal values. Maybe you really, really liked working with that boss, and now they've moved you to a different department. Maybe you really, really liked working on that component, but now you have a new component to work on, and you really don't like that. Right? This is real. This is what happens during change. But what do you do about it? Do you stay disgruntled? There's a pitfall to that. You don't want to stay there. Why? Because what happens is it becomes rigid. You become unmovable. You won't, nobody can move you, not even you. If you stay in that long enough, you're just going to be. That means you're just existing. You're just surviving. It's just another day at the office, right? That's not where you want to be. Another one that I wanted to point out is it leads to mismatched behaviors and emotions, which means that a lot of times when you're in this situation, you'll find yourself behaving abnormally. And when I say abnormally, I mean for yourself. You're even surprised that, I don't know why I said that to her. Why did I look at her like that? Why did I procrastinate and not get that done on time? That is so not me. What happened? Oh, I used to do this, but I don't do this anymore. Those are the shifts that happen when you're in a pitfall, when you're kind of spiraling, OK? All right, here's the thing about resilience. Resilience is not about bouncing back. When people think about resilience, everybody thinks about the amputee that has on the leg that ran the race and won. Oh, he's so resilient, right? Or we think about the mom that's at the hospital with this baby that's near death and they can't find a cure and she starts a GoFundMe and she gets the money and the kid survives and wow, she was resilient, right? Or someone survives a tragic car accident, they have some really bad physical things that happen and they survive, they come back and they write this book and they become a speaker and wow, that's resilient. Isn't that what you think about? When you initially think of resilience, somebody share with me, when you thought about resilience, what came to mind? Anybody, shout out. Strength. Say it again. Strength. Strength. What type of situation are they in, though? A crisis. I like that word. What else? Don't be shy. I don't bite. Adversity. adversity. We're going to define adversity in a little bit. Anyone else? Quarantine. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Flexibility. Flexibility. I like that word. Once again, what kind of situation are you thinking about when you think about flexibility? All kinds of situations. All kinds? All right, I like that. That's a good word. All right? A lot of times when persons think about, you're going to have me say fortitude, when they think about resilience, they always think about this horrible, horrible thing. But resilience is more about how you do everyday life. How do you take advantage of risk and opportunity? after you've had five times that you've been shot down? How many times do you still speak up at a meeting when you feel like nobody's listening to you or they don't want to hear you anyway? That's resiliency. What do you do when you've put in five ideas to your boss and he hasn't even responded to them? Do you keep putting them in or do you stop? 
Does your work production or performance become mediocre at that point? Or do you keep excelling? That's resiliency. Resiliency is having a sick kid and having to go back to work and not being mad at everybody at work because you don't want to be there. You want to be with your kid. That's resiliency, but we take that for granted. Resiliency is about bouncing forward, not bouncing back. Resiliency is about having a purview that exceeds where you are. It's not just about thinking outside the box, but thinking outside the earth. How do you get things to happen when you've gone through so much? How many of you, well, I don't know, in Texas we do. How many of you dread driving on the highway because of people cutting off? Have you ever driven somewhere that you absolutely do not like driving? No? Everywhere you go, you love driving? <laughs> wow. OK, maybe I've moved too many times, because I have a few on my face. Absolutely. But you get to the point where you're like, oh my gosh, i got to drive. I do not want to get on this highway. And you get out there, and what happens when you're driving? Somebody? I heard someone say someone. Something. Someone cuts you off. Traffic jam. You get, that's the one I wanted. You get defensive. You start driving like everybody else. No, I'm not letting you in. Absolutely not. You stay in your lane. Resiliency is everywhere. Because see, when you get back in that car, you have to take a deep breath and you have to choose your actions before you even start to drive. You have to decide that you're not going to become something you're not, but you're going to stay true to who you are. All of that encompasses resiliency. So here are the seven skills of resiliency. You guys all got a sheet of paper that says RQ test. Guys out there, hopefully you have the RQ test. If you haven't finished it, I'm going to encourage you to finish it because it is going to help you measure where you're resilient and where you're not, all right? And we have seven of them, and I'm going to go through each one to explain what they mean, and I'm going to have you help me because you're going to give me an example of what you think that looks like in everyday life. Is that fair? So those listening virtually, I expect you to be typing in because I'd like to hear one or two from them as well, all right? So here we go. Emotional regulation, the ability to stay calm when triggered or under pressure. How many of you have ever been under pressure? Oh, great, honest. OK, here's, here's, here's the trick. How many of you have lost it under pressure? OK. Emotional regulation. How do you regulate when things are just pressing everything out of you? What do you do? Do you know yourself well enough to know what can trigger you to go out of character? Or do you think you know? Question? All right. So we develop a set of skills so that we can control our behavior. Our behavior is what normally is the, it's the thing we're not most proud of when we're in an emotionally stimulating situation. Because we go from emotion to action. And that action can be the decision not to act. For those of you that go, oh, I don't do anything. I just walk off. That is your, that is your reaction. You decided not to do anything. That is what you do. You become introverted. You turn inside. So just because you're not blurting out something or that you're not going off on that person, doesn't always mean that you have control of the emotion. It's the ability to address it without being charged even further. OK? Impulse control, one of my favorite ones. The word for this is rabbit syndrome or shiny. So basically, with this one, you're the person that starts these, these um, projects. Or you get into these things and you're all like, yes, we're going to do this. It's going to be so great. You're going to lay out everything. And the next day, you walk in like, what? I didn't mention anything. What? No, but there's this other thing over here. Let me show it to you real quick. This is absolutely amazing. Impulse control. Impulse control is when your ability to stay on task, your ability to proceed even when things are coming up against you. 
See, that's the kicker. When you've been assigned something, but uh, the pieces, everybody's not kind of cooperating. You know, how many of you went to college and did those group projects that the professor used to give out? Oh, absolutely. Tina, you're laughing. You know what I'm talking about. He gives out these projects, and you get in there. Your grade depends on this thing. It's five of you, and three of you are slackers. What happens? <laughs> See, you were practicing resiliency from you were in school. You didn't even know it. Because you buckled down, and even though you're gritting through your teeth, that project got turned in, I bet. You made sure of it, because your grade depended on it. Yes? You didn't just sit there and pout, and you had to get it done. But over time, when you're constantly put in those situations, after a while, that muscle, because resistance is kind of like a muscle. That muscle kind of gets a little bit like, mm, I tired. And I'm not even going to bother. It ain't turned in. Oh, well, I guess we all going to be in trouble. <laughs> you know, or you start playing, a, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know we were supposed to do that. But you knew exactly what was supposed to happen. But that was your passive aggressive way of saying, yeah, no. <laughs> OK. So definitely impulse control is definitely a big one. Optimism. Now, when I say optimism, I have a lot of people that use a furrow their faces and look at me like, I'm optimistic. Absolutely. Um, the thing with optimism, I'm not talking about irrational optimism. I'm not talking about Pollyanna, where everything is wonderful all the time, every time. Optimism, realistic optimism, is the fact that you know there's a possibility of a better outcome, and so you keep going after it. It's not resigning before you even start. It's wanting to see something through because there's that possibility that something can happen. And you're willing to go that edge to make it happen. That's resilience. Because you could easily do the opposite. What would be the opposite of that? And anybody? <laughs> Giving up. And that what that lays against. Because resiliency, it stops you from giving up. Resiliency helps you to persevere. It keeps you to push, even when you don't feel like it. Takes us back to emotional regulation, right? Not being hijacked. Come on. There we go. Causal analysis. Now, this one a lot of people get stumped on because we all have this sometime. And that's being able, causal analysis is your ability to know what really is the cause of your problem. So I'm going to give you a scenario. I shared it yesterday, and I'll share it again today. A guy is, is working in a law firm, and the law firm was just acquired. And his daughter had been extremely ill for the past couple of weeks, almost, I think it was like six weeks or so. And his wife calls him one day and says, hey, babe, I can't take her for her testing. She'd been having test after test after test. But the wife finally could not leave work to take her for the test. <coughs> babe, you have to take her for this test. So he's like, no problem. I haven't taken any time off. I got this. Walks into his boss's office. And it's like, hey, sir, you know, you know what's going on with Katie. She's been really sick. We've been having all these tests done. Um, Sheila just called and said that she can't take Katie. So she asked me to take her. Can I get off a couple of hours early so I can make it to the appointment on time? Because I have to pick her up from daycare and then take her there. And his boss looks at him and smiles and goes, oh, yeah, sure. But don't make it a habit. Good. Got all the responses I wanted. <laughs> now, this gentleman has a choice to make at this point. Does he sit there and go off on his boss? Does he walk away and kind of work through it to figure out why was he feeling all these emotions? Because at that point, he got hit with every emotion you could think about. He got hit with guilt. He got hit with um, anger with this gentleman. He was frustrated. This company just said that they're all about work-life balance, and here they are telling me. He went back and forth about this thing. What he chose to do was to think through it over time and separate his emotions from the facts of the situation. And then he decided to get some answers, because he didn't know why his boss had responded that way to begin with. What created that, that question? All he did was, initially, was react to all of it. By the time he had walked out the door at 2 o'clock to go and pick her up, he had pretty much cursed everybody that ever thought about the building. <laughs> like, he was just done, like completely done. But he did it. He made sure that he didn't do it to affect his peers. 
he made sure that he was in a space where he could actually sit down and decide what was at the cause of this? What really happened? Do I have a balance? Because he went from the, the me always and everything. I do everything around here. And they always have to have a comment for me, always. Right? The not me. They just don't know how much I'm worth. That's why they're doing this. That's what's wrong with them. You see? But he sat, he thought it through, and he figured out what belonged to him feeling guilty, how he was hurt about his daughter, because he still had all of that he was dealing with, his personal stuff. He had to deal with his wife calling. He had to deal with, and now he had his boss doing this. Are you guys seeing how resiliency is an everyday thing? Do I get a yes or a no? Resiliency comes in all shapes and sizes. But the most important thing is not to be like the lady with the cockroach. You have to choose how you want to proceed. How do you want to move forward? How do you want to look to the positive, to the possibilities of what could happen? Okay? Empathy. How well you read other people's cues. Oof. Ooh, that's a tough one sometimes, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, Nicole, it's a tough one. Thank you. I um, appreciate that. It's a tough one, isn't it? Yes. Okay. It's absolutely a tough one. Because sometimes you're like, that can't be what she meant. Oh, why is she saying yes with her mouth, but her eyes are telling me to leave the room? <laughs> I cleaned it up. I'm good. Right? You know, you start looking at people's cues. Oh, they taught me that if your arms are folded, you're mad. You're defensive. Maybe, maybe not. Have you gotten to know the person? Have you taken the time, or did you automatically go into that me, 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 they're all out to get me kind of thing? The ability to read people's cues helps you in every aspect of business, from your customer to your coworker to your boss to networking, if you've ever networked. You have to know. You know, if you walk into a conversation and the, the circle is kind of closed in, do you walk in still and talk? Do you join that conversation? It's a networking event. Do you join? Yes. Absolutely not. It's a closed circle. If the body language is open, that means there's space for others to join. So when you walk in and it's like this and you feel like a fourth wheel and everybody says, they didn't want me there. They were kind of not talking to me. They talked around me. They didn't even change the conversation when I introduced myself. Body cues. Just to pay attention. Just learn more about it. Because you can walk away feeling like nobody liked you at the networking event when you weren't even operating in proper protocol. So that's one thing to think about, right? All right. Self-efficacy. Believing that you can solve your own problems. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yeah, I believe I can get this, yeah, yeah I got it. Many times you come across persons that if they're not aware of themselves, they can score very low in self-efficacy. And here's why. If you are a person that likes people to please people, and that's not a bad thing. I'm not knocking it. It's a behavioral style. Some people are just, that's how they, they feel motivated. That's how they move forward. If you're that type of person, if you're not careful, this is going to be very tough for you. Because I'm going to get something together, and I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to be like, hey, can you um, look over this? And the minute she says, well, there's some problems on here. You need to fix A, B, and C. That person will walk away with this and be like, but I thought I had it all. I don't understand. Why didn't she help me figure it out? Why did she just tell me that? Why didn't she just explain it to me? What happened? I know y'all never experienced that. It's okay. Um, <laughs> I have clients that do, so blame it on them, okay? But you walk away not knowing how to solve this problem anymore. Now, for some people, it's a knee jerk. Kudos to you. If you knee jerk that way and you self correct, you should be fine which means that you realize, you know what, I can fix this myself. I can solve this without her. I absolutely have the tools to do this. I am skilled, I'm intelligent, I can make this happen. Instead of going down the thought cycle or the spiral effect of, she doesn't like anything I do. Every time I tell her, she always has something negative to say, always never enough. Big difference. 
But self-efficacy is you believing that you can solve this problem, whatever it may be. You know, we talked a little bit yesterday. I'm just going to touch on this really quickly. We talked a little bit about conflict. Some people have a hard time with conflict and self-efficacy. Because when you hear the word conflict, what do you think about? Really quick, because I'm throwing this one in here. What do you think about? Run. Say it again. Run. Run. <laughs> Love it. Run. What else? Conflict. What do you think about? Anger. Anger. Are we getting any responses from virtual? Who's doing virtual? None? OK. What else? Stress. Stress. Fighting. Fighting. Negativity. Negativity. What if I were to tell you that conflict is nothing more than unmet expectations? What if I would say that to you? What does that do for you? That's solvable. Solvable. You agree with it? Neutral. It's neutral. What else? Does it give you something that you can work with? It's an action, not an emotion. It takes it into an action. Because now, if you want to resolve a conflict, if she, I'm not going to pick on you because I don't know you yet. Tina, I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of the viewpoint and I'm, OK. But if Tina and I are in a conflict, and I'm feeling like at my wit's end, but I remember the conflict is unmet expectations, what can I do about that no matter how I feel? Change my expectations, what would be something else? Communicate. Communicate and clarify the expectations. OK. Now you have a tool that takes this to a different level. Now you're able to bring those emotions where they're regulated, where you know what to do with them. You don't feel like you're spiraling. You don't feel like they don't like you, and she just won't listen to me. And it, you're able to stop it because now you know it's about expectations. It's not about you versus her. It's about the expectation of what you're supposed to deliver. How do you make that happen? All right, I threw that one in because self-efficacy really a lot of times makes people feel like they can't deal with conflict. People are afraid of conflict. But as I shared with them, conflict is how connection is solidified. Conflict is how things grow. When you think about a butterfly, everybody loves to do the butterfly. You know, but people don't realize that butterfly got to struggle to come out of that cocoon with those wings. And if you cut it any too soon, if it doesn't go through that conflict, that rubbing, that friction, the butterfly will die. It has to go through that in order to grow. And I'm giving you all some key words here because I'm going to ask you all a question at the end. OK? <laughs> so in order to grow. <laughs> not working. All right. We have one more. Let's see if it'll go back. Nope, not going back. OK, self-efficacy. And I'm going to jump on. If this is not the next slide, I'll talk about it anyway. Reaching out. That didn't go right. All right, so reaching out. Reaching out is your ability to take hold of opportunities and risk. This is what all of these accumulate to. They, they give you this ability to do. When you are scoring low in that arena, you will not step readily into opportunities. You will not be in a space of creativity. You will be in a space you're so bogged down by what you feel, what you feel they don't like. You're in this thought cycle that kind of goes like this. And you can't get out. And right now, I want everybody to stomp their foot like this. Can you stomp your foot? Stomp your foot like that one more time. What we're doing right now is we're putting a stop to that cycle. What we are learning here today is for you to implement for you to stop those cycles. One of the things that I absolutely enjoy doing is helping people move from being in a place of hovering and being able to take that step forward, to move forward in whatever it is they're doing. Because we all have a level of, they use the term greatness, but I believe we all have a level of the next level in us. There's something that you're holding yourself back because you're in an emotional cycle or you're in a thought cycle, and you're just, some of these you can fix. This. You can look at these. We can strengthen this. Hey, you go to the gym and you work that muscle. Not me, but you go to the gym and you work that muscle. That's exactly what we're talking about here. But if you want to work a muscle and you don't ever pick up a weight, I don't want to tell you. It's not going to happen. 
If you want to be that person that speaks out at meetings no matter what happens, you want to share your great ideas, you want to be part of a collaborative team, you want to get along with that coworker, you want to have the culture, the environment, the work environment that you love, this is how you do it, by employing these resilient strategies, putting these into action, doing your own self, I'm gonna steal that word you shared yesterday, diagnostic, you guys know that word, right? No, nobody knows that word but me? Okay, well somebody taught it to me, I'm blaming her. No, I'm teasing. But you're running self-diagnostic. What's not working? You know, we're dealing, this is automotive. When the car's not, you have to run that diagnostic on that car to figure out what's out of whack. But you gotta have some measurement first, right? So for me to just stand up here and go, yeah, you're not resilient. Well, how do you measure that? You guys have the RQ. You can take a look at those things that were up there and figure out what do you need to tweak? What can you improve when? What skills do you need to learn? What do you need to research? Maybe you need to look up some things and go, okay, how do I become better at? And please don't try to do all of them at once. That is absolutely futile. You will be tired before you even start. It's about picking one thing or another, right? All right, so the next thing that we're gonna talk about real quick, I'm gonna have to skip that slide. You're good. All right, when it comes back up, we're gonna talk about stressors and what that looks like for each different type of behavioral style. All right, I like to correlate it with behavioral styles because not all of us are the same. Not all of us respond to stressors the same way. And that's all a trigger is. It's a stressor. Sounds like a more comfortable word, right? Stressor, people like that word much better than a trigger, right? <laughs> but either one, all roads lead to Rome. You're gonna still need resiliency for either one, right? So when it comes back up, we're gonna talk about that. What does good stressors look like? What does bad stressors look like? You guys can play with it when I hear it comes on. All right, so let's talk about knowing yourself. Well, actually, let's talk about thinking cycles. How many of you have ever heard about a thought cycle? Absolutely. Anyone else? You have? All right. How would you propose we get out of a thought cycle? If you're in a thought cycle, right, that means that you are having this, this, this emotion, right, or this thought that's leading to this emotion, that's leading to this action, and you just keep doing the same thing over and over, no, 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 again. Change the channel, all right, I like that. Change the channel, she just threw the whole book out. Change the channel, okay, what else can we do? Reflect, reflect. self-observation is number one, that's number one. Self-observation, reflect, that's another word for that, absolutely. What else do you think would be the next step? A positive feedback loop, give me more. Yeah. Right, staying committed to the objective. When you're here at work and you're having, a, a, if Tina and I are having a disagreement, I can't lose fact of the fact that our objective is to be able to work together and solve that problem. We both have one mission, one goal. A lot of times what happens though, we get into that loop and we can't stay committed. We can't, we can't remember even what we all talking about. Like what? Oh, you're just so mad at that point, you don't even know anymore. But you have to be able to do that. What else do you need to do? Look at it from a different perspective. Absolutely. Look at it from a different perspective. Because a lot of times we have to put that empathy in place, right? You look at it from the person, other person's one. We need to give the optimism in place, right? Look at it as if there's possibilities. A lot of times when we come head on with someone or we're going through something and we don't like a policy or we don't like a rule or we don't like a directive, the first thing we do is go head on with it, right? But if we were to step back and think, okay, what's the big picture for this? What's this, this next size? Then we go down. Then we come down to, well, how do I fit into all of this? What is my part in this? How do I take ownership for this, right? We come all the way down but it's about looking at it from a perspective. But a lot of times what we wanna do is we wanna look just from here. But we have to go up like eagles, and we have to soar. And we have to be able to look and see the whole thing. Because you know, an eagle looking down at you when you about to do. That's how an eagle sees you. You begin to realize that I'm just a part of the puzzle. I'm just a part of a whole. 
But a lot of times when you're stuck in a thought cycle, if you think about it, that thought cycle creates a bubble around you because then it becomes all about just your feelings. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm not bashing feelings. I'm not bashing emotions. So please don't leave me and go, she just don't like anybody to feel anything. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that emotions and feelings have their place and that you can override them. There is no reason for you to feel out of control with your emotions, no matter what they've said to you in the past. There is no reason. That is a totally different part of your brain, and you can move to the frontal lobe where you can logically think about it. But see, the thing is you have to begin to have a plan. See, that's why we're doing this. You need a plan. How are you gonna stop that cycle? Where do you need to strengthen yourself out of these seven skills? You all have situations that you're dealing with in your personal uh, cubicles, offices, buildings, virtually, that you're dealing with. How are you facing those? Are you facing them with resilience? Now that I've given you a brief overview of what, what I present with <laughs> resilience as, now when you think about resiliency, and we had some words that still transfer, what do you think of? What situation do you think of? Do you still only think of an amputee that's running a race? Or do you think of something more? Do you have a thought that's coming to mind? Yeah, Nicole, we're thinking about it. <laughs> I need feedback. Yes, ma'am. Hard conversations, that's a whole nother day, guys, I promise you. But hard conversations, I talk about hard conversations a lot because people don't realize that there's so much growth and value in hard conversations. The only thing we've been taught is that they're not gonna like me. They're not gonna, you know, we're, we're friendship is gonna be broken, the relationship is gonna be damaged, da 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 da. And we get stuck. How many of you have heard of Maslow's hierarchy? We get stuck in that sense of belonging. And if you stay stuck there, you can never reach self-actualization. You have to do something about this. You cannot get stuck here. And that's what you get stuck in when you're doing that. You have to begin to think, I want to become all that I'm able to become. I want the company, my office, my team, what, to become everything it can become. This is why I say resiliency is not about bouncing back. It's about bouncing forward. It's not about just surviving, it's about thriving where you are and becoming bigger and better than where you are right now. All right, so this is what I was saying about the different styles. And I think about this like when you go to the, to the, to the eye doctor. How many of you have ever been to the eye doctor? Everybody with glasses seem to have their hands up. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so when you go to the doctor, the doctor says, number one or number two? Number one or number two? What? So this is pretty much what we're looking at right here, okay? We're gonna decide whether we like number one or number two. All right, so this is what happens when someone is in a reaction mode based off of their behavioral styles, all right? So if you're a driver, when you're in reactive mode, you become insensitive, impatient. I don't like talking about myself. Let me start on another one. Okay, so, no, I'm teasing. But creates a win and lose situation, refuses to bend and overpowers others. Right, that's when you're in reactive mode. That's how you know if you shift it, is you're in a reactive mode. If you're an influencer, right, at that point, you become, and that should say antisocial, I'm sorry. You become antisocial, right? You don't, you're not optimistic anymore, I'm sorry. This stuff is all wrong, I apologize. You're not popular anymore, and you, you just, you don't care. You just give in to whatever everybody says. And normally an influencer is someone that can what do they say? You can sell water to a, a, no, sell ice to an Eskimo, that's an influencer. If you've ever met somebody that can sell ice to an Eskimo, that is an influencer. But when they're in reactive mode, they're not trying to sell you anything. They just start agreeing with everything you say. Okay, sure. They're reacting at that point, okay? Go around here, defensiveness. Passive aggressive, your anal analyzer. That's the one that needs a little bit more details, right? They become overly critical and they overanalyze because at that point, they're, they're just reactive, right? A steady person becomes withdrawn, 
just gives in to people. Normally, they're a people person. They're all about the people. They're all about fighting for the people. And then at that point, it just goes, okay, whatever. Basically, what happens? All right? They let stuff simmer. They don't come and say, okay, let's have a talk. All right? Because they're the people that want more information. They want you to give them more facts. But when they're in reactive mode, they don't care about nothing. They're just like, okay, sure. You start hearing a lot of that, that's not a good thing. Okay, sure. I don't know if you noticed that trend that just happened like that. Other than the drivers, because we're just going to tell you what to do at that point. But everybody else just becomes a, okay. So if you have a lot of people on your team going, okay, sure. Okay, sure. Okay, sure. We're going to say number one or number two. Number, oops, there we go. All right, so when they respond, though, when they, think, when they have that thing in place and they've decided to get out of that thought cycle, what happens is they begin to acknowledge tough situations. That's when we're the ones like, let's have the hard conversation. We don't mind that. It's when we stop having the conversation that's the problem. Willing to be objective, right? Our influencer starts communicating with everybody, right? Starts to encourage dialogue, provides reassurance. It's going to be OK. We got this, right? You need some ice? Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so we get down here to your analyzer. They find the root cause of a problem. This is why we want them operating in that place. We don't want them reactive, because they're going to help you figure out what's going on. Just have to listen, right? And they focus on facts, which is good. But when they're reactive because they feel like nobody's appreciating that and everybody thinks they're an ice queen or they think that they're just out there, they're not going to operate in that. You're going to see it start to diminish and diminish. And it may not be happening to you right now, but if you stay in that cycle, stick around a couple of years. I promise you, it'll happen. If you're not implementing resiliency, all right? And steadies, they look for other people's feelings. And they, commu they communicate tactfully. They're the ones, like I said, they're going to come and be like, so what's really going on? How are you doing? But when they're reactive, they're just like, OK, sure. <laughs> so I ask you, number one or number two? Number one, number two. Number one. <laughs> Absolutely, number one. No brainer, right? We all want to operate in this part of where we're at. But what that takes is not allowing yourself to stay trapped in the other parts of your brain. That is all logical. That's all frontal lobe. When, they, when neuroscience, when they light that up, when they're starting to deal with this, they're all, this is all what's lighting up with them. Emotions don't light up. Even though, if you look at it, steady is looking out for other people's feelings. But it's still not lighting up in the emotion part of the brain. It's still lighting up up here because it's a conscious effort. They're taking control of the situation instead of feeling out of control. So that's, that's that part there. All right, let's move on. OK, let's get to learning your ABCs, because I have the questions on here, and I'm getting in trouble. All right, ABCs, guys. There should be another sheet on there that says your ABCs. So here's the activity that I want you guys to do. I want you to think of a situation recently that happened. And I want you to write it out. This goes for everyone. I want you to, I'm not collecting it. I want you to write it out, but I want you to write it out void of emotion, right? So one of the examples that I give a lot of times, I think it's on there, is the one where the employee is having a, a conversation with their manager or leader, and they want to send a letter out to a customer, but the leader's saying, no, 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 I want to make a phone call, I'm sorry, to the customer, he's going, no, send an email first. Now, the other way that could be written is, I was trying to talk to Mr. John about it, and he just wouldn't hear anything I had to say. He never listens to anything I say, and he thinks I'm not going to be tactful when I call, but I just want to call and find out what's going on. We want the emotion out. So I want you to just put it as facts. We have a client that we need to approach. I want to make the phone call. He thinks I should send an email. Those are the facts. So write down the situation, void of the emotion. I don't care if it's somebody who cut you off on the highway. We just need it for an example for you to understand how your ABCs work. It's your agitation. It's what agitates you. It's your trigger. What's another word? Stressor. 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 We're going to stick with A's. Because I get ABCs. Huh? OK, antecedent. All right, I like that word. Huh, I'm going to have to steal that one. OK? All right, so let's get it written down, guys. I'm going to give you a couple seconds.
Are we writing out there? Do we have any questions coming in virtually? Everybody's quiet? All right, virtually, I'm gonna need you guys to get involved. I need something from you, a comment, anything at this point. Who's done? Yeah. Succinct and to the point. Oh, wait. Does your paper say I don't have one? I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm teasing. Two words. Two words. Ooh. I need an encounter like that. I never had a two word encounter. All right. Now, as soon as you're done, for those that are done, because when we have persons virtually that are done, I want you to go straight to C, consequences. I want you to tell me, what did you do when it happened? When you were in that situation and you were agitated and aggravated and any other A words you can put in there, what did, what did you do instantly? What did you instinctively do? Did you shut down? Did you fuss back? Did you go straight into a head-on debate? Did you plow through that wall? What did you do? Did you yell at the driver and make hand gestures at them like they could hear you through the car window? I just wave when people do that. What did you do? Oh, I see some people smiling and looking up. Oh, okay. Yes, I see hands up. I thought I did. I didn't say, I did nothing. Okay, <laughs> you did nothing. She did nothing. You pro okay, yes. Ooh. Found a solution, but it hindered her relationship with that person. Anyone else? Real quick, can we get a third one? Say, ma'am. It got kind of loud. <laughs> that was said very diplomatically. It got kind of loud. Not much, but just a tad. Just a tad bit. I got you, just a tad. Nicole, is there something else? Raise their hand so we could. Okay. So if you guys do have something, can you please raise your hand? Because of the taping, they'd like to get it on the mic instead of me repeating it as if it's my question. Though it looks good to me. I am. All right. I have two questions. Oh, good. I'll take it. One of the virtual reviewers uh, mentioned his stressor was having a salesperson that hasn't followed the steps to a sale and let the customer leave without checking in at the sales desk. Mm -hmm. That was the trigger. Mm -hmm. And mentioned the reaction was that he reacted in all caps. <laughs> <laughs> he reacted emotionally by chewing him out for not doing what he was supposed to do. Okay. Now, here's what I want you to do. And thank you for sharing that, my virtual viewer. Now, what I want you to do now that you've seen your reaction, I want you to go into that B column. And I want you to write, what were you thinking at that time? What did you believe at that time? What was your belief system at that time? And yes, it does change. That's why I say at that time. What were you thinking? My virtual viewer, you may be thinking, he just never follows anything. They just never listen to what I say. You know, if he just had done this, it would have been easier. What were you thinking? Yes, ma'am. At the time of the, yeah, when you, usually, this is normally how we go. It happens, we do what we have to do, then we go back and we start playing it over in our head again, and we start telling ourselves everything that that person was wrong with that person. That's why we're back in B. So what was going on at that agitation? Because we react first. We have no consciousness of what we're really thinking. And then as we calm down, you notice the thoughts become, well, maybe, kind of, and then you come into that logical part of the brain. And so what we're gonna try to do is break this cycle. Anyone else want to share? Were you were protecting. Okay. How'd that work? <coughs> it worked? All right. It, not great, but it worked. Okay. Let me ask you this. Do you think if you were to lead with your thought and your belief first, which means you check your thoughts and belief first, do you think you could have had a different outcome, a more productive outcome? She's like, for me to say no means that there's not room for growth. And no, I, I know where your, your train of thought is going, but it's just the question is as it is. Because it's realizing that even though you may be like, man, that was just, that's just not how I wanted to show up, or it could have been better. The question now is, how do you change that thought, that belief system right there? And the whole idea is going to be for you to stop, 
Let's think about the waiter. What was the first thing he did? Did he rush over there and try to fix everything? Or did he come over, and when it landed on him, what did he do? Did anybody remember? He was stop yeah, he was calm. He stopped. He, somebody said the word I used, I changed it around, but observed, right? He evaluated the situation. Then he acted. Do you know what would have happened if he had just jumped over there and tried to catch the, could you imagine a waiter walking up to this female? Like, let's be real, guys. And he's just, oh, let me help you out. And he's trying to grab this roach off of this female? Not well. Right? That's not going to go well. Because now he's going to be hopping everywhere, and she is not going to be too happy with him. You know, because now not only does she have a roach, she's just a fondler. Like, it just didn't go well. Right? So it's so important that we are able to stop and look at these everyday things. And see, once you start practicing it, it gets better. It's just like a muscle. You get stronger in those areas. You're able to, to look at things from an eagle's view, not just staying stuck in that bubble that happens with that thought cycle. It's so important, especially in the face of change. 11 moves, I cannot explain to you the amount of emotions that you go through, leaving persons every three years, having to reinvent yourself every three years, having to put in job applications every three years, or start a new business depending on what country you're in. How many times you had to learn a new language? How many of you walk in and you don't know what people are saying? How many If I were to stay stuck in that in reactive mode, I would be another military statistic. I would not have 27 years under my belt. These are things that I learned doing that. I learned going into companies. I've joined businesses that were in the beginning of a change, in the middle of a change, and I came in as a newbie embracing all of the change and everybody else didn't like me. <laughs> I've been at each stage of it. And I've learned with all of those stages, if you can just begin to look at these different arenas, you can begin to apply them. Now really quickly, I told you there was a quiz at the end, right? Didn't I tell you that? I promised you that, right? Okay, so here's the thing. We're gonna go back to nine. Ah, oh, there it is. You guys have core values. And I want you to help me, which I know the answer, Brittany, that sounds good. I want you to help me assign core value, your core value, to all nine of these, because they fit your core values. So I'm going to shout out one, and you help me. Fun. That's my favorite one. Fun. <laughs> Optimism. Fun is not just surface, oh, giddy, I'm so happy to be here. That, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about enjoyment. Being in a space of fun actually stimulates creativity. So being in a space of creativity. So what do we have? Everybody said optimism. What else? Reaching out, absolutely. All right, let's go to the next one. Growth, powered by the people. Impulse control. Reaching out. Reaching out. Empathy. All right, let's go to another one. Uh, constantly improving. I know I'm saying that wrong. Improve, thank you. Improve constantly. Which one? Causal analysis, nice. What else? Self-efficacy, emotion, absolutely emotional <laughs> regulation. You can't go far without that one. Because honestly, improving is nothing more than change. So honestly, if we were to look at that one, that one could probably do with all of them. That, that's all improvement is, is change. Being open and ready to change and equipped to change. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. All right. Let's see, which one did I just do? I did fun. Take personal ownership. Personal ownership, yes. Emotional regulation, what else? Impulse control. Empathy. Self-efficacy. Okay, last one. Customers for life. Reaching out, empathy, emotional regulation, impulse control. The short answer for that one is all of them. 
all of them. So let me ask you a question. Well, questions, I'm sorry. I like words. Who can tell me what is resiliency? What is now your definition of resiliency? What is resilience? Bouncing, Bouncing, Bouncing forward. forward. And how do we do that? Changing behavior. Anyone else? Changing your thought yes, changing your thought process. Absolutely. One more time. <laughs> That's a good one too, or have one. Like if you didn't have one before, this is a good time to start. Okay, absolutely. What are some of the benefits of improving your resilience? Growth. Growth. Better relationships. Better relationships. Yeah. Happier. New opportunities. New opportunities. Yes, that's my favorite one. What else? I'm all about risk and opportunities. Y'all will learn that. What else? Be more productive. Yes, be more productive. If you are striving to become a high performer, this is your ticket. You can look at Harvard. Business Review, you can look at all of them. They're all saying that resiliency is what makes the difference between the average and the stellar. All right? What are the seven components of resilience or resiliency? What are the seven components? We just went over them, the skills. Optimism. Impulse control. Empathy. Regulation. Reach it out. Self-efficacy. I missed one. Causal analysis. That's the one no one really likes. <laughs> because at that point, you really have to take ownership for your part in the situation. Honestly, causal analysis is where you're going to sit there and really realize, OK, what part is theirs? What part is mine? What part are the facts? That's a tough one. That's a tough one. You want to talk about needing some resilience to, to swallow that one, right? Or some fortitude. Somebody used my word. I'm absolutely loving it. All right, so let's go on. What are some st strategies for avoiding or pulling yourself out of a thinking trap? S, stop or self-observation, either one. Self-observation, what else? What else? Making assumptions and ask questions. Oh, stop making assumptions and ask questions. Absolutely, what else? Observing from a different perspective. Observing from a different perspective, what else? Yes, run your diagnostic. Figure out what's going on. Give me one more. Does virtual have anything? Nope, OK. Separating emotion from action. Separating emotion from action. When we started, I said I had three objectives. Did we cover the objectives? So I want someone to tell me, what is one thing that you're going to commit to today? Actually, write it down. I want all of you to write on your piece of paper. I hereby commit to. And I want you to pick one area that you commit to working on over the next week, starting today. And with that, I say thank you. If you're interested in connecting with me, there's my information. And I thank you all very much. It's been my pleasure. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. I think we all have opportunities, whether it's with our coworkers, customers, families, what have you, to really pause and think about that react versus respond. That was very, very valuable. Um, thank you all for taking some time to invest in yourselves. Way to show personal ownership over your own development. We're all very busy. We all have a lot going on. And I think it's important you acknowledge the time. There's also a couple other thanks that we need to pass around. These type of events uh, take a fair amount of teamwork uh, to put on. So for those of you that participated in a committee this week and pulling together the event, whether it was content, logistics, et cetera, please stand real quick. Thank you very much. Thank you. And lastly, I would like to send out a huge thanks to Nicole Erland in the back. She has put so much passion and energy into this event. And I really appreciate all of your efforts. So thank you, everyone. We hope you, you enjoyed this. And uh, have a great rest of your day. <laughs>